Oh boy, you're going to love this episode. We got to talk to Mike Matthews, one of my favorite people in this space. In today's episode, he gives her he gives us insider secrets into the supplement industry. I mean, he breaks it down like how much do these supplements actually cost supplement companies? What are the margins? How do they profit, right? What does the marketing game look like? What about the dirty stuff that happens in the supplement industry? All the crap, all the supplements that say they have something that they don't or they actually have illegal pharmaceuticals in their products. Like We talk about all that and more. Great, great episode. Also, here's the giveaway for today, MAPS Anabolic. If you leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. And if we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to the flagship MAPS workout program, MAPS Anabolic. One more thing before we get going with this episode. Two MAPS programs are 50% off right now. MAPS Performance, this is an athlete-inspired workout program. And MAPS Aesthetic, which is bodybuilder-inspired, are both 50% off. So here's how you can get either one. If you want MAPS Performance, go to mapsgreen.com. If you want MAPS Aesthetic, go to mapsblack.com. And the discount code for both of them is FEB50. All right, here comes the show. I didn't know this about supplement companies until I met you. you. You see a supplement company, you see, oh my gosh, there's you know $10 million of revenue, $50 million of revenue, but you have no idea that, I, I had no idea that the margins on supplements could be so small, especially if you have a quality product. So, you know, 10, you, like you told me, I remember when I talked to you at first, you said, if you have a 15% profit margin with supplements, you are crushing and I remember I, I said that's away. very good. That's very good in supplements. Yeah, I got blown if, away by that. So how did you get affected by the by the supply chain stuff with supplements? I was working with there's a company that I was I don't want to say who they are, but I was working with and they were asking me my advice on what uh, like a new product. And so I was giving them, you know, like ingredients and stuff and they said, "Well, we'll see if we can get our hands on stuff because it's really hard to get certain things right now and the supply chain's really weird and whatever and uh, they weren't able to sell certain products. Do you guys get affected? Do you have to change like who you were working with? Like, how did you navigate all that? Fortunately, we got ahead of the supply chain snafu by placing huge orders early last, or well, middle of last year is when we started to place big, big orders. You know, I had to get a, I had to get nearly a two million dollar SBA loan just for that because it required a lot more money than, and, and um, I, I've. I've been pretty conservative in, in managing Legion's finances in terms of cash reserves and whatever, but I only have so much cash. And to make sure that I was going to get what I need this year, I had to come up with a lot of money uh, in the middle or so of last year. And and that's with lead times being all wacky. I mean, there were some... So I, I work with several manufacturers. One they were giving me 40, 50 week lead times. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> 40, wow. 50. Wow. Wait, you can't run a business like no. that, man. What are you talking about? 40 to 50 week lead times. Give me a break, right? <laughs> what does your percentage look like as far as uh, what you spend the most on advertising between like Google retargeting, Facebook ads, and let's say probably Amazon, I would guess are those your three major ones you probably mess with? What's yeah. the, what's yeah. the per percentage look like? Good question. You guys, you guys will probably find this interesting. So, Facebook, uh, what do you think my Facebook spend is at right well, now? Well, I bet you. So, you know, we just shut ours down. Yeah. We've shut ours down for the last three. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I bet you've either reduced it significantly, or you're probably like us to where it's really low. Where are you at? I, I'm at zero dollars a day. Man. Yeah, wow. and so zero. are we. So are we. We've been. It's now. I want to say six or seven months. Would you say, Doug? Mm. Yeah, about six or seven months now. And no impact to revenue, right? Oh, no, we're going the other direction. It's going, the Google retargeting is doing phenomenal and the Facebook ads is, was uh, looked like now, looking back, was contrib contributing very little uh, to the business. So really interesting because that was just, what, two years ago. It was a big deal. Yeah, everybody was talking about how amazing Facebook was as far as a place for advertising. So that's interesting. You did Why do too. you think that is, Mike? Why do you think uh, Facebook is mm -hmm. not as effective as it used to be? Well, I mean, that, that iOS update was yeah. devastating. It, it, it totally messed up attribution and, and also messed up targeting. And that's where I know uh, in in my business and in other, other businesses, that's where it all started to go wrong. You mm. just could not get the results that, um, that you were getting previously. Now, I even question at this point the, the quote unquote results that I was getting previously because uh, again, we go from we never spent that much on Facebook. Um, I, I'm going to guess we, we peaked at 
maybe 100K a month. I think it was a little bit less than that, maybe 70 or 80K a month. And according to the numbers that we were getting from Facebook, there was there was a good ROI. But again, we we go from that pretty quickly. Like we went not overnight to zero, but within a month or so to go from that to zero and see no appreciable change in revenue <laughs> makes me wonder what was going on. Now the the problem for people who are who are in the know on this, of course, is attribution where Facebook's pixel is taking credit for sales that were happening other they were going to happen otherwise it, what they were not actually driven by that advertising and um and so in my experience i've worked with with several ad agencies a few big ones uh, that have been really bad um if you were to look at their websites and their portfolios you'd be like oh they're going to do great no the the agency game not to get off on a tangent but i hate this that the agency game is here's how it normally goes. You have a core of people who are good. Uh, and let's say it's marketing. They're good marketers. They're good advertisers. They know how to make stuff work. They know how to sell. And they, they, they get clients and they get results and they get more clients. They get the idea of starting an agency. Then they start making more money and they want to scale the agency. And it's basically impossible to find people who are as good as they are. Right. So they get, they get people... Maybe they find if out of every hundred hires, there's one person who really stands out. So then they have now themselves, they have another layer of, uh, of effective people who they give their biggest and best accounts to. Right, right. And their but they want to keep growing. They want to keep scaling. They don't want to limit their growth to, to, that, to their ability to actually deliver results. So they just fill their organization with low-skilled people and... And then give all of their uh, less important, less profitable accounts to those people. And the MO is do as little work as you can, get the bare minimum results to just keep the client. And then eventually, you know, you'll lose them. Um, but it doesn't matter with with your own marketing being good. You'll you know, and yeah, you'll you backfill will get, three for the. You every, will, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You will get wins with with your biggest clients, and you just use those to sell. And so I've worked with um, with with agencies and and Facebook. What I've concluded is that it's not hard to do well with remarketing, with retargeting, for example, on Facebook. And that's something that I would recommend you guys look into. I'm going to bring that back because I think that's some, I think that's easy money. Where um, and, and it goes to to the question about the 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 viral, the funny the funny ad. That ad has done quite well with people who are familiar with us. So on a remarketing mm-hmm. basis, on a retargeting basis, it's done well. It, it has outperformed um, with with the agency that we've been working with. Outperformed, I think, most everything that they've tried oh, up until well, now. That's cool. with cold Within traffic your own community, though, though. Okay, exactly with people who have at least heard of us. They're familiar with us. They've been to our website. Maybe they've read an article. There is a, there is at least a slight positive association there. But with cold people who, if they have heard about us, we don't have any way to know that. And a lot of these people have not. Uh, it did okay, not well enough to to really roll out at scale, and that's not surprising when I when I look back at how that ad was put together um, and in that it was mostly entertainment and it, and it wasn't strong in terms of like actually selling you on, on Legion. Um, but, but it also wasn't expensive. It only cost me, I think my all in cost was like 35 or 40 K. So I've, and I, and I'm, and I'm able to use it um, still able to use it. I might be able to use it indefinitely on a retargeting remarketing basis. Yeah. Um, so, so anyways, uh, Adam, to finish answering your question, that's where Facebook is at. Google has been doing quite well for us. Google shopping has been doing quite well for us. So we continue to scale that Amazon is in an awesome place in that revenue is, is almost at high. It's like, well, actually is, I mean, I look at it on a monthly basis, I'm thinking daily numbers, but so we're, we're doing the best we've ever done on Amazon, uh, in terms of revenue. But our spend is very, very low. We we have cut our spend from, I mean, it probably peaked at 100 to 130k a month. We've cut it to like, 
I don't know, 30 to 40 K a month. Now, do you, and, is that, is, do you, do you attribute that to like a compounding effect of you just being on Amazon for so long and the reviews coming up and now you have lots of books on there now. And so because of that, you're going wider. And so, and well, probably ranking higher organically that you don't need to pump so much. Is that why? Yeah. So I would say it's two factors. One is this, is this brand factor that, that Legion is, is becoming a bigger brand. Um, we're getting the most traffic to our website we've ever gotten. We're getting the most brand queries, you know, on search engines that we've ever gotten. We are working with the most influencers that we've ever worked with. Like everything is, 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 is as big as it has been. And so of course, then uh, some of that trickles over to Amazon because we, we really Try. I'm always l trying to come up with more reasons for people to buy from my website because LTV on my website is almost lifetime value for anyone listening um, is almost three hundred dollars, mm. uh, two two eighty or so right now. Nice. And and LTV on Amazon, you can't you can't get it as exactly as you can on your website, but it's it's about one third of that probably okay. eighty to ninety dollars. And if someone buys from my website, I now have somebody I can communicate to. I have an address, I have an email address, I have a phone number. Amazon shares none of that. So um, so yes, I think that there's the just the organic uh, growth of the company. And then there, there are some interesting um, new strategies that we're using on the, on the paid side of things to mitigate some of the um, inflation of, of Costs. I mean, it is so expensive to advertise on Amazon. Now, Amazon has really changed. I mean, the, the, this is a good example of, a, of an interesting principle in business. Um, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you think of a successful business or successful businesses or even books or really anything that has done well in a marketplace, and, and you try to answer the question, like, what's the primary factor? What are the primary factors that really, that really made this work? Was it funding? Was it the, the quality of the idea? Was it the team and, and how well they executed? Or how was agile it, you are? Was it the timing? And, and um, I think you can make a really strong argument for the importance of timing and doing the right thing at the right time. And you could argue that an idea isn't a good, like you have timing and idea as two different things. You could argue that a good idea is something that has at least a little bit of good timing to it, but I think it is helpful to, to break that out. And when I started on Amazon, whatever that was seven years ago or so, that, that, was, that was good timing. It was way easier to gain traction. Amazon advertising was way cheaper. Um, it was way less competitive. And you, you look at, you compare the, 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 the situation then to now. And if you are, I can say with certainty in sports nutrition, if you are not already fairly entrenched, meaning you are seated all throughout the websites, also bots, you have thousands and thousands of reviews on your product. Uh, you have, and, and the, you have at least a four-star average, ideally a four and a half-star average. And um, if if you also have, it, it helps to have attained high rankings in the past. That matters. The history of the ASIN matters. An ASIN that has performed really well over a long period of time gets a lot more love from Amazon and their algorithms than an ASIN, which like a SKU that's brand new. Even if it, even if you come in and you pour tons of money into it and you spike sales and you lose money on every sale, you're like, I'm going to burn through $5 million just to establish this product. It still might not work. Like when you, when you finally turn that spigot off, you better be able to sustain those sales in other ways or, you're going to lose traction in a very competitive space like sports nutrition. So um, that that's where that's where the advertising is at. And I think the for 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 me going forward, what's clear is I do I do know that that Facebook and I'm sure for you guys, Facebook acquisition can work. But my current hypothesis, so to speak, is that it requires really good advertising. It requires, you're not going to be able to just, it's, the, the, the days are gone when you could just put together something that's okay and, and just get it out there and, and make good money and get a good return from that. 
it, it seems like um, f- with cold acquisition, the people who still make that work have outstanding advertising, and and none of my advertising has ever been outstanding. Yeah, so, it's just it's just hmm. much more competitive. You know, a while ago, Mike, when we talked to you a long time ago, we talked about um, some of the dirty tricks that supplement mm, companies yeah. will will make. Uh, like I remember learning about uh, amino acid spiking to make a protein. Still, still goes on. Well, I was just going to ask you. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you're that you're seeing, or or is there is there anything new? Like, what are things that consumers should look out for when buying supplements? Uh, because it is a, and I'm very supportive of un, of of open markets. It is an unregulated market, but that does place a lot of responsibility mm-hmm. on the consumer, uh, much more than if it was a very regulated market. Like what are th- what are some of the dirty tricks and things they need to look out are for? Still playing games with negative reviews on Amazon and all that as well. Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, fortunately, fortunately. I actually, where's some? Is this wood? Yeah, it's wood. I'm not on wood, wood. <laughs> <laughs> because because, because I, it's funny. I was just talking with my CEO yesterday. I was like, you know, um, it, we've had a good run here. We haven't had anybody <laughs> really really messing with us. And it's probably not because they're not trying. It it seems like Amazon has has better systems internally because because it's it's not in their interest, of course. If you take a, a really hot ace and a really hot product and then it gets taken down because of shenanigans and it takes a month to get it back up, that's bad for Amazon too. Yeah, I mean, right. they take yeah. they take fifteen percent off the top of every sale, right. um, and and they get their advertising nut too. So they get a lot of money oh, wow. out of every sale. And, and so there, there has been certainly less of the uh, kind of like guerrilla warfare, which is, which is nice to see, but that has been replaced by the soaring costs of advertising, which fortunately, again, um, I mean, my, my revenue split now is about 70% website, 30% Amazon, where when I first met you guys, it was the other way around. That's right. Yeah, Amazon, yeah. Amazon was 70% of my revenue and I've focused all of my personal efforts on growing the website and the people who work directly with me, basically we've worked on nothing but growing website revenue and letting Amazon grow at a slower pace, even though Amazon, we're still going to grow at 10 to 15% this year, but I, I'm much more interested in what I can do with the website. Um, so anyway, so so what still goes on in Amazon, of course, is the review nonsense in terms of um, gaming reviews and I don't know how Amazon's going to stop that. It's not in their interest to stop that. It's in their interest to pretend like they want to stop it. And it's in their interest to have the occasional news story out there that they deleted 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 fake reviews. And they are, uh, they are you know, s- s- policing this and watching it closely because, of course, that inspires confidence in consumers. But when you know that there are probably 30,000 fake reviews posted every 10 minutes wow. uh, on the website. I mean, maybe it's every hour. I might be sensationalizing a little bit, but um, when you understand the scale of the marketplace and what goes on, you, you all, you understand. How, that. how are they doing that? Are they having like real people in these like, you yeah, know, review like farms, farms yeah. in India and China or whatever that are just leaving reviews? There's that. Um, there, I mean, so... There are services still. There are fewer of them because Amazon has gone after them and shut a number of them down um, just by threatening, saying, we're Amazon and we're, we're going to bankrupt you in court if you just don't go away, basically. And um, and so there, but there still are services that are more kind of like underground now. You have to be in Amazon selling groups. You have to uh, they don't have a website you can go to and, and sign up on, on basically. And um, so you can buy reviews and they're expensive and that's risky because um, so, so the argument for doing it is that ev- quote unquote, everyone else is doing it. That's one argument. That's where it usually starts. Right. So it's like, well, it's like if you're a professional football player is using PEDs cheating, of course not. Cause everyone is like, yeah. if you're not using them, you had better be the most disciplined super freak of super freaks because you're you're not going to be able to keep up or you're going to barely keep up with the people who are like you but also on drugs right so so similar similarly on on Amazon the argument is like well basically everyone's doing it 
And, and also, if you're buying reviews and if you're doing it in a kind of an anonymized way, even if Amazon, quote unquote, catches you, the, the, how do they know that was you and not a competitor buying reviews to try to get you banned? Right? Yeah. Because you could do that then, right? Yeah. I, if, I were, if I were a shady person, I could then just start buying reviews for a competitor, a co- competitive product yeah. and then get caught. Oops, right? And, and so that's an argument for doing it. Yeah. The argument I, against- I, I learned about this on, about social media too. I don't remember what I watched, but uh, it was a, a, like a documentary on Instagram and talked about how many so, fake- social, social dilemma. Social dilemma. Talking about how many fake followers there were. And they said, well, yeah, Instagram- wants the fake followers too because it makes people feel like they have more followers there's more people on there so i could see how amazon would you know kind of not mind if there's a lot of reviews that are fake because it adds credence to the product probably sells more you know it adds value to the platform so long as people think those are real reviews. (laughs) yeah that's the key right right it's like it's like controlling anabolic steroids in sports like you said exactly (laughs) it's optics it's optics right it's it's almost like politics um and and so 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 you can you can make some arguments for doing it the argument against doing it though is in my case for example i've been on amazon again for what it is seven years now we do quite well it's growing and i just i don't want to run the risk of getting banned because yeah. if if they do like you you can get banned for that stuff it, you just just arguing well it wasn't me i don't know who was doing that is is that that is i wouldn't i wouldn't um bet millions and millions of dollars of revenue on something like, like that and you know and i think that there's an argument for generally playing by the rules and and not doing things that are just blatantly detrimental to the marketplace um so so there there is still a lot of that that goes on it's not it's not as easy i mean there was a time when there were websites and this was actually there was a time when amazon they didn't have a clear position on this what you could do is you could go to a website and you could say hey i'm selling this thing on amazon I'm willing to give it to free for people if they leave me a review. Oh. And I'm, I'm not going to incentivize uh, a good review versus, versus a bad review. They're going to get the thing for free and they're going to leave a review. And theoretically, that's okay, actually. Amazon, again, they didn't come out and say, we are explicitly okay with these services, but that was not actually really a, a break in their TOS because Amazon is okay with you giving away things for people to check out. And then if they want to leave a review, they can leave a review. And if they want to leave a good, right. So, but, but of course the, I remember this one website, what they did is they allowed you to see the, the each reviewer's history and, uh, and, and then you see like the the people you want to send it to. (laughs) Exactly. And those people, but then it became, but, but because it was transparent like that, the incentive as a reviewer was to always leave a five-star review because if you ever left a one, two, or three star review, you're going to get passed up. So you're not going to get free uh, stuff. Exactly. So, so what you had is you just had a bunch of people who would always leave five star reviews. Wow. And so, 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 you know, it's just, it's not surprising when, when, when you, when you see things like that and, and, and you see how these little marketplaces pan out and how human nature works. Um, but, but it just goes to show how hard it is to your point about free markets, how hard it is to try to, centrally control everything you know what i mean it's not gonna work people are resourceful when 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 there's something in it for them people can get pretty creative in yeah. figuring out how to get it you is know? is the supplement industry trending better or worse or the same in the sense that in, in in the in the context of like having what they say on the bottle is in the bottle or not having impurities i remember there were a couple investigative, you know, reports. Yep. And they I haven't seen one in a while, but maybe a few years ago where they went and tested, I don't remember, 15 supplements and found that 12 of them had little didn't to nothing. didn't even have anything that they claimed. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're taking or a like capsule of metals. Yeah. Know. Like wheat, you know, and it says it's got yeah, salt, metal. I remember, dude, I remember it sticks in my mind because it's so absurd. House plant. That was one. It, it was just, it was powdered house plant <laughs> in the, in the <laughs> house plant. That was actually wow. like in, in the report, wow. uh, powdered asparagus. That yeah. was, that was another one. Yeah, man, this, uh, yeah, this, this creatine's not working. What the hell? So it, yeah. would you say it's getting better or worse? Is, is the markets like weeding these, these crappy products out or is it still a bit of a wild west? Um, so, so what I've seen is that you, you have different 
levels of sophistication in consumers, right? This is true of any market. And uh, this, this, isn't, this doesn't <clears throat> imply intelligence, right? A low sophistication buyer is not necessarily an unintelligent buyer. It's just somebody who's new to this and is not very informed. We were all low sophistication buyer. I used to go to GNC once a month and load up with like hundreds of dollars of stuff, you know, go what, what's in the, what's the newest uh, awesome testosterone booster. What's in the, what's <laughs> behind the lock and the key in the back of the, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, in the back of the store. Right. Yeah. So I was once that person. I, I like to think I'm not stupid. At least I just was uninformed. And so what, what we still have is we have a lot of low quality products, low quality ingredients, small amounts of ingredients. Um, even, even some of the, some of the, the, the label games where it doesn't even have to have uh, any of the ingredients, actually, if you're working with, with a shady manufacturer. And, and, and those types of products tend to be sold to the lower sophistication buyers. Those are, those are for example, fat burners that are, that are claiming you can lose 20 pounds in your first month just yeah. popping these pills. Or they are um, testosterone boosters. Those are very big right now. Testosterone is a very hot topic, particularly among middle-aged and golden-aged people, right? And so you have products that um, are, are being sold more on... You, you have some internet marketing, but you don't reach that crowd primarily through the internet. So you have like infomercials and radio commercials, right? And so you have you have a lot of those types of products that um, are are minimally just they're they're ineffective ingredients, tiny doses. But um, th- those are also obviously the people who are willing to cut all corners. Like if you're willing to sell to blatantly just lie to people um, to to get their money, then why not? just lie a little bit more and, and get even more money. Yeah. Right. You, I mean, at that point, you know what you're I feel, in for a penny, you're in for a pound. You know what I feel like, Mike, I feel like th- that there's these people that own, I don't know this for sure, but this is what it feels like to me that they'll start a shady supplement company, sell a bunch of products. Uh Oh, they're kind of getting found out, stop. And then re- let's go, re- let's re-brand. go legit now. Yeah. Or go <laughs> rebrand and start another supplement company Yeah, and kind of, it's almost Apply like the same hustle. It's like the snake oil salesman that went from town to town selling their crap. And by the time people found out in the town, they went to the next town type of deal. Kind of reminds me of that. Do you, it, does that happen or am I just, am I just imagining things? I mean, your debt, what's his name? Aaron Singerman is, is he's in prison. Now, right? I mean, there's a perfect example of that, and and PJ Braun is probably next. Hmm. Oh, is he getting in trouble? The Blackstone Labs? Oh, yeah. Redcon One Singerman is gone. He's he what? he's going. He, oh, he's going to prison. He's he's in prison right now. Didn't they just? Didn't they just to prison? Didn't they just get acquired recently? Or did they acquire somebody really big? They were, they were in the news. What I, was I, the deal? I don't know the whole story here. What's the deal with that? Why is he in prison? For for selling steroids in supplements. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, um, Damn, I, I didn't, su- I, di- I just, which read, supplements I, were these? <laughs> I, I, it was, it was, I, it was Blackstone Labs, I believe. It was him and PJ Braun. I don't want to get details wrong okay. because, um, just, you know, uh, on principle, but, uh, there, there's no question that he is, that Singerman is either in prison or going to prison. Wow. Or for selling illegal drugs, steroids. Um, and, and it, it, that was a, that was not a Redcon one. Thing, that was a Blackstone Labs thing, but what you just described is the story of Singerman and Braun. It was Blackstone Labs selling steroids, then Redcon 1 to quote-unquote go legit. I don't know if Braun was ever associated with Redcon 1, but Singerman definitely. I mean, he is wow. the found, or maybe co-founder, ex-CEO, but yeah, if, if it looks like you guys are looking it up right now. And yeah, so, see, yeah see, Doug's pulling him Doug's up. Doug's pulling right? up. Doug, see if there's, you can find a, a news yeah, pull article. The article. Okay, so I just read, I wish I remember what the article said, but I brought uh, big Redcon news uh, to, the, to the podcast about seven or eight months ago, and I can't remember what the news was. I thought they either were acquired or they made a big acquisition and made What's, big big headlines. And I, actually, I thought you and I talked about it. I thought I... It's not, I know. Didn't I'm, you and I text about it? I could have sworn I sent it over to you or you sent it to me and we were talking about, oh, shit, did you see this big move? 
And I De- deja vu here. Here's here's a PR news wire. So Redcon one. This was April 2021. Complete strategic investment. Um, well, it says here former Blackstone Labs co-founder Aaron Singerman sentenced four and a half years behind bars. But but what was it for? You're saying sold steroids. Was it because I know I've seen this before where people will buy like a boner pill and mm-hmm. in there is actual Viagra or an actual pharmaceutical Yep. Or, or were he, they just using their big platform of people to backdoor and sell? Yeah, or black were they market. actually selling steroids, or were they selling supplements that said they were test boosters, but actually contained like, you know, super draw in it or something like that? Like that's that's what yeah. I want to know. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure because oh, I no. just read. Yeah, it looks oh, I'm like reading it. it. Yeah, ready for the? Here's the quote. Open that up a little bit, Doug, so I can read this. So it sold says a dietary supplements. Yeah, selling selling products uh, labeled as. Hold on a second. Selling products labeled as dietary supplements that actually contain controlled substances and unapproved drugs is illegal and potentially dangerous. So that's that's the deal that happened. So so apparently. People were buying. That's the that's the old shell game. The, that that's been going on for a long time, dude. Yeah. And that, you know what's funny? I bet the reviews on those supplements are yeah, great. Well, wow, Holy really shit! I mean, remember <laughs> Craze? Remember yeah. Craze? Um, you guys had to have yeah. had people reaching out to you about Craze when that was. What was that? So that was that pre workout that had meth, basically. <laughs> I, I missed Dude, this. I used to get emails at Whoa. least a handful a week. Every week, I agree people would, would, would reach out to me saying, Have you ever tried this stuff craze? It's, I've never felt a pre workout like this. It's amazing. And so when I first heard about it, I went and looked at the label and I was like, I don't get it. I mean, have these people just never had caffeine? It has some caffeine, it has some creatine, and like nothing else. It's, there's just nothing in this. Uh, well, there actually was meth. It turns out that meth, it turns out that meth makes a pretty good pre workout if you guys ever. Uh, yeah, that's next level uh, right there. Yeah, yeah, this pre workout's great. But you know, I was the next thing I knew, I was uh, grinding know, my teeth. I was giving my, yeah. Yeah, my workout partner a hand job and I sold my kids. I don't know what happened. For more for more craze. <laughs> for, this is, this is that craze. This is oh wild. God. So now okay. Oh wow. I did see you know what's funny? We talked about this. I remember. Yeah, yeah we I remember, did. I remember we brought God it up. Damn it. I don't see, even remember. This is this is but what I, I miss out on. This is so what I miss out on by not trying a lot of look supplements. Up, out Doug, on. could you look up uh, either you know Redcon Redcon one acquisition or acquired and see what you get? Because I know Mike, you and I talked about this a while back, and I did not know that they were in this mix. I didn't know that they got because PJ PJ Braun and the Singerman guy, they're all Blackstone Labs. So what right. does Redcon have to do with that? Are they are- so, so Singerman was was part of Blackstone and then looks like he went off to start Red- Redcon. I don't think Braun is associated with with Redcon. That oh, was Singerman's okay. thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and to 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 what you were saying, Adam if I remember correctly, it was um, was it was it a PE group that invested in? That's the right. Company? We're looking we're looking at it right now. Just as com- yeah. uh, Redcon One complete strategic investment from uh, Trivest Partners. So yeah. somebody that's what it was. They got a big money infusion. That's what right. it was. Which means they th- maybe four hundred thirty five million in capital. Well, equipment. well, no. Remember, because because I remember Adam texting with you, and we were like. They, that company is worth four hundred thirty-five. That, that gotcha. was the size of the fund. That was the size of the fund. It, it. They didn't. They didn't say how much. Money are, they now you're, now it. it's all coming back. That's exactly yeah. what I remember. I think I sent it to you because I was blown away at what I yeah, thought. I mean, that, both of us were like, "What? What yeah. kind of revenue are they?" Yeah, like, we were I mean, like, to get, a, "To get a valuation like that, I mean, you're talking like 300, 250 million in revenue. No way. Well, no, that was the size. That was the size of the wow. fund. Now, wow. and it, it, we don't know how much. Now, Mike, what about this? What about when a study comes out? that says, um, you know, new compound found in whatever increases fat oxidation in, you know, in vitro or whatever by 15%. Yeah. And then a company takes it and turns it into a fat burner. Do you see still, do you still see a lot of that? Well, they'll take Absolutely. a compound with one silly study that it really doesn't mean anything and then just blow it out of proportion and sell it as the ne- next greatest thing. That's, that's, that's just a, a common marketing ploy is to, um, take mechanistic research, take animal research, take in vitro research, and uh, and just assume that that people are not going to really look into it. Or even if they did try to look into it, they're not scientifically versed enough to understand that this doesn't mean that it's <laughs> going really. to actually do anything <laughs> for you. And and there are a lot of ingredients over the years that have shown promise. Not even in vitro have been have shown promise in let's 
say rat research, which uh, some people wonder why rats. Well, we actually share, it's like 99% of our DNA with rats and, and certain uh, elements of, 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 uh, rat physiology are similar to, to human physiology, like, like metabolism, for example, even though rat metabolisms run a lot faster. And so that's why uh, animal research will often start with, with that to see if there's any, any reason to believe mm. that this could be effective in humans. Um, but then when we get to the human research, it's a flop. Um, raspberry ketones are a good example yeah. of that <laughs> showed promise in rats seemed, seemed to work great. Um, but then completely flopped in humans, tribulus terrestris showed promise in rats for testosterone boosting. And you still see that product or that ingredient in so many testosterone related. Now, now I'm going to defend tribulus for a second. I'm going to defend it for a second. It won't raise your testosterone, but it can boost your libido. I do notice when I take it, if I take a good quality one, I do get a bit hornier, but I don't, I know there's no raise in testosterone, but that's probably going to confuse a guy, right? He'll take it and be like, it must be raising my test, but really you're just a little extra horny. Yeah. What yeah. is it, and Mike, what is it that you- It can help women. It can help women in that department too. Yeah. It's actually, it's, it, that is in my multivitamin for women for that reason, but not in the world. Well, do they know you put it in there? Or is that a sneaky? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's on, it's on the, out, uh, hey, I, I, out there. I, I've actually had people, I mean, it's, it's on the sales page. I explain what the ingredient is. Yeah. I cite the research, uh, but, but I have had people reach out confused, like, wait, it's in the women's yeah. product. Yeah, bro, I'm buying another bottle for my wife. Great multivitamin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so, Mike, what is it that you, uh, what do you wait for um, before you decide you're going to experiment um, with something or, or add it to your line? Like, what are you waiting for? Yeah, Obviously, what are your standards? Yeah, what does it look like? Good question. So, so one, there has to be good, good human evidence. Mm. Um, there, there have been a couple of ingredients over the years that we've used that only had animal evidence, and the. But my my asterisk with that is I, I made that clear. Like I, I never I never would base a formulation because the 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 thinking behind the formulations is all right. We need to have a foundation of ingredients that have a lot of high quality human evidence of not just efficacy, but also meaningful effect size. Meaning that if something were to increase your testosterone by um, some tiny amount yeah. that is insignificant, 10%. if you, yeah, if you, if you only, if you only, if you play a little bit of a numbers game, you can present that in a way that actually sounds kind of interesting. But if people understood that going from 600 to 660 NGDL means absolutely nothing, right. uh, then then they wouldn't buy the product. And so um, so I look for for not just efficacy, but also some that something meaningful is happening that that actually is going to help people get to whatever goal is associated with this product. It could be, it could be, it doesn't have to be necessarily muscle growth or fat loss. Like, you know, it could be a joint product that meaningfully reduces joint inflammation, meaningfully reduces joint pain, meaningfully improves joint health, for example. And, um, and so in the couple of cases where we've, we've used like rutacarpine is, is an ingredient that we used in our sleep product, because there is interesting animal research that indicates that it might help the body clear caffeine out faster. You told me this a while ago and it's legit. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's legit. It, I, I, if I take it, cause I, if I have caffeine too late and I take that, I, I do, I do, I, I, it's like the caffeine is out of my system faster. Just like what you said. Hmm. And, and so, so the reason that like, that's an, an example of a specific ingredient that we were okay with using, because although there was only animal research um, and, and, you know, I, I work with people who know a lot more about formulations than I do. And so I can't even take the credit for this stuff, but um, one, we were open about it saying, Hey, this is a, this is a speculative ingredient. You could even say it's a hail Mary if you want to be very skeptical, but it's not very expensive. So we're not asking you to pay a a premium to, to have it. And even though it is just animal research, there is a good reason to believe that if anybody, if, if there ever is human research, which something like that, there, there may or may not be like, where's the money going to come from, mm -hmm. for example. But if there is human research, uh, there, there's a, a fair chance that, that it will work because for example, here's, here's what it does in rats. Now we have other examples of things that do similar things. And then we've seen those things do similar things in humans. So 
again, by this is this is extrapolation and it's speculative, but you know that's why we have felt confident enough to include it. But generally, generally, we're looking for not just one study showing effectiveness or efficacy in humans, but multiple studies, ideally multiple trials, plus at least at least one, if not more meta-analyses, ideally research reviews, ideally there's, there's enough mm-hmm. clinical data to do some studies of studies. And, and also who was the research done with that matters because uh, if, if something is shown to do great things in, in someone. I mean, if we, if we look something like intermittent fasting, right. Something that I'm sure you guys, I get asked about all the time. Mm-hmm. I have to, I have to comment on it like every quarter or so, just because it's a never ending topic. Yeah, right. Too. Yep. And, and so there's some interesting research out there that if you just took it at face value, maybe if you just read the abstracts of those papers, you might be impressed of, uh, with what it could purportedly do for body composition and for insulin sensitivity and for um, for certain biomarkers related to to aging and but what is is missed is that when you look at a lot of that research it was conducted with sedentary obese people and and we are and a lot of people listening are not sedentary obese people and so it is an extrapolation. It is a jump to assume that because somebody who is sedentary and obese saw a marked increase in insulin sensitivity following an intermittent fasting diet, that we would experience the same thing when we are active, we have a healthy body composition and so forth. Yeah. You know, I'll give you uh, another example of that, Mike, like DHEA in old, uh, in older populations, you'll see increases in strength and muscle and bone mass that does it does even even in testosterone yeah it, actually that, it, it, it doesn't do that for for younger people and that's because when you're over 60 or whatever you, you your dha is low and you can see that but eat in so and to take it even a step further there are certain supplements that have been shown in studies to raise testosterone effectively but only in men with really low testosterone so like if you're like really low like 150 then you may see it you know you know go up to 350 but if you're anywhere in the normal range, you see almost no bump whatsoever. And then another thing I wanted to comment on, when you mentioned the 10% increase in testosterone from 600 to 660, it's not much. It's not going to do anything. But what supplement companies will often do, and I remember years ago when I picked up on this, they'll show a graph on the ad, and they'll be like, before and after. And like, yep. holy shit, that's huge. But when you and, read- and wait, you're like, wait a minute, that's not even 10%. That's yes. like 50%. <laughs> you'll look at the graph and you'll notice that the, the bottom number is 600 and the top number is, you know, 670. Yeah. So okay. it went from here to here. Holy <laughs> shit, that's a big. Yeah. But what they did is they just changed the. Yeah, they changed the X and Y axis and now the, the graph well, looks super dramatic. And circling back to your, your fasting comment, I believe, was it was it Walter Longo that did the research on basically if you were to eat a low calorie calorie diet for a week or so, you're getting all those benefits that yeah, the, all, all the, the, benefit. fa- the fasting community is touting about. Yeah, all the benefits, <clears throat> physical, physiological benefits really come from the calorie deficit. You can argue the potential spiritual benefits, but that's also depending on the on the individual because it can also go in the opposite direction. Fasting can yeah, become- Yeah, that's, that's a great point, especially when weight loss is involved because oh. we know if somebody loses weight, uh, especially if they're going from very overweight to not very overweight, their insulin sensitivity is going to improve Everything. quite a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it's all the same. Calorie restriction versus fasting, you'll see the same stuff. But there's some spiritual benefits for some people, but in other people, it's the opposite. You'll get the opposite of spiritual benefits. You'll get this dysfunctional uh, eating pattern, which we see well, the people, in our space all the time. The people we recommend it to are the complete opposite of what you would think, right? So the people that we, we are, tend to be like your competitors or somebody who has this attachment to food. They have to eat every other hour. They, they're, they're so attached to eating every two hours and they haven't broke that cycle for years. And it's like interrupting that and saying, hey, you know what? You're going to be fine if we don't eat for 24 hours. There's tremendous benefit yeah. to somebody who has a relationship with food like that and breaking yeah. that kind of addiction to having to eat that way. Whereas the people that are using it are typically the people that are seeking out the fat loss benefits. And those are the people that don't see very much yeah. benefit from, if anything, it ends up worsening their relationship with, with uh, food. Yeah. We used to just say that you're just not eating enough or you're skipping meals. You know, Mike, I want to ask you, cause I know you, you give a lot of credit to your research team, uh, but truth be told, I'm going to, I'm going to toot your horn a little bit. You're you're very, very one of the most knowledgeable people people I know about supplements. I'm also a massive supplement nerd, and you and I 
sometimes go off together on, on stuff like this. For the last seven years on the podcast, I've been talking about uh, creatine and how it's going to be probably going to be one of the number one used health supplements. Forget muscle building, forget strength. We know it does that, but just for general health, cognitive health, heart health, uh, you know, organ health, mitochondrial function, all that stuff. What are you seeing with creatine? Are you seeing some of the stuff that's that's coming out with some of its health benefits? I just read some studies on arthritis, um, yep. on you know helping with dementia. I mean, it's pretty incredible. And have you thought about actually marketing it that way yourself instead of just as a performance, just maybe purely towards like a health? Yeah, great, great, um, great questions. And your prediction was was spot on with creatine. At this point, uh, I guess my um, it, it, my prediction is that over the next several years, I would not be surprised if creatine becomes a supplement that is uh, considered useful for, for everyone, yeah. not just people who want to get jacked, everyone of all ages, especially people who don't eat enough protein, especially people who are, are older. Um, you know, I know, Sal, you've you've been talking some time about the emerging research in, in cognitive yeah. benefits. And um, uh, since, since I at last heard you talk about that, more research has come out. And it, 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 uh, it appears that you might need to take a bit more than the standard three to five grams per day if you want to get the biggest brain benefits, so to speak. From Interesting. It, it appears that uh, up to 10 grams a day actually might be significantly better in that regard because it's hard to get, it can get through the blood brain barrier, uh, but it, but it's hard to get certain things through that. And it takes a bit more to get enough into the brain to make a difference. Um, but we see it, we see it, how it can impact uh, bone health and we see how it can impact uh, retaining lean mass, especially in people who now, of course, we would always want people to, to, do some sort of resistance training. Yeah. Um, but, but in, you know, that as much as we would love that, not, not everyone is going to do what we want them to do. And, um, so, so creatine is, is, it's interesting that, you, um, it's been, it's been around for so you, long that it might have another, a whole new kind of breakthrough in popularity. I, I, I saw a study on, uh, pregnant animals and they gave the animals creatine and the, the, the offspring were, healthier, more fit, stronger. And if you understand how creatine works, uh, obviously it supplies more of the fundamental fuel that all cells use. It yep. makes perfect sense. I think they're going to give it to kids. That's what I think. I think it's going to I was ju I was just going to say that, you know, I had I had a professor on my podcast, uh, Darren Kandow is his name, professor Sir, uh, at the University of Regina, which yes, that is the way that you pronounce it, <laughs> Re Re Regina, and and it's and my favorite he has, university. <laughs> he has he has about I think 90, 90 peer reviewed papers on on creatine. A lot of it is regarding body comp, but he's a deep deep expert on it. And I asked some of these questions to him because, totally. like kids, for example, I get asked all of the time. And and his position is absolutely kids can take creatine, and there are there are good reasons why we 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 might want to start including some creatine in children's multivitamins, for example. Which I believe I believe in giving. I give my kids a well formulated. I would love to make my own actually uh, line of children's Please. products. I, I have you know how hard it is to find a good, good multivitamin, one for kids. right? Yes. A really good multivitamin yeah, that has again just just. The, the same approach that I've taken with Legion, like, all right, I'm going to sell. I just, I just did an analysis and I'm going to see how I can integrate this into my marketing. But we looked at, at our primary competitors and I got quotes from my manufacturers on their products at, at similar scales that they're running at, right? How much would it cost me to make what they're making versus mine? And when you compare my multivitamin to uh, my average competitors, I'm spending almost 80% more. <laughs> like multivitamins, the, the the name of the game with a multivitamin generally and with capsules in general is you make that a profit center. You want to spend no yeah. more than four, four or $5 a bottle on a multivitamin. If you're really generous, you might go to 6 or $7 a bottle. 
And, and that, that drives profit. Whereas a protein powder, there's not as much profit. A pre-workout is, can be profitable, but not as much. You use those to get your customers, then you sell them pills. And because pills, you don't have to flavor, for example, it's just cheaper, it's easier. So um, in, in the case of a multivitamin, right? So mine is costing me almost $15 a bottle to make. And then I also have to like get it to people. It's expensive. And I, I suspect that if I did the same thing, with a children's multivitamin, I could make something pretty outstanding if I was just willing to spend more than the average. Uh, I would, I would company. love that. I, I've been looking for my kids, and it's complete garbage that's out there. Now, Mike, circling back to the creatine talk, I believe I saw you were going to do a a hair loss study on creatine. Did you follow through on that? Did you do anything? Yeah, yeah. So, so we started that, and then COVID uh, paused that, and then. It was, we don't know when we can get it restarted. And so we ended up repurposing that money in that lab into other research. But that's something that I would like to come back to. And I, I just, we, the, problem, we, the problem with COVID and, and now we might have enough uh, prediction to, to be able to run the paper is at the time or run, run, the, run the trial at the time, it was like, we don't actually know when we can even restart. And then if we can restart, we don't know how long we can go. And if we can't go long enough, like if we're just collecting data piecemeal in small amounts over the course of who knows how long it, it might, it might just not work out. And so that's why I was like, okay, well, can we maybe do something well, else? Can we get some research done on, you know, a shorter, something else. And um, I would like to come back to that though, because Unfortunately, that's still an open question, even though... I'll make a prediction. I'll make yeah. a prediction that... Because I'm, I'm sure someone will do the study if it's not you. And I'm going to show... I, I'm going to predict they're not going to show any effect on hair loss. And the speculation comes from the slight increase in DHT. That Which they, still was in the realm of normal, by yes, the way. Yes. Okay. Like so it was, it's not like it shut got DHT out the roof to super physiological No, levels. no, no, no. So you have testosterone. We all know what that does. Then there's a hormone called DHT, which is related to testosterone, but it's very androgenic, right? So it gives you the masculinizing effects and high DHT can, can potentially cause your prostate to enlarge. And if you have a lot of DHT receptors in your scalp, then you're more likely to go bald. This is why men tend to go bald uh, than, and women don't. And why some men go bald and other men don't. It has nothing to do with who's got more testosterone and more DHT, but rather who has more receptors in those areas, especially in the scalp. And the rise in DHT from creatine is inconsequential from what I've seen. I don't think it's going to do anything for hair loss except for maybe the most hypersensitive individual in the world who's probably going to go bald by 22 anyway. Right. Otherwise, I don't see... I don't it's also also mechanistically ambiguous. Like there were yes. a couple of uh, hypotheses about how this possibly could even work, but the 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 researchers in that paper with the rugby players, they were also a little bit like, huh? um, how, how 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 could this even happen? I'll guess. Uh, here's another guess. I I bet because it increases ATP, cells do a better job of what they're supposed to do. So you probably have your lighting cells producing a little bit more testosterone, maybe a little bit more DHT. But, there, but remember, there was no change. There was no such effect seen in testosterone and free testosterone, mm. only dihydrotestosterone. Yeah, but it was it was so a small. A little bit odd. Yeah, I don't know. I th I, I, it's going to come back and show nothing. That's what I think, um, you know, from it. And I was, I was excited to to be, you know, again, I'll, uh, if, I, if I can, if I can restart it, I, I will because it would be nice to to get that out there. Yeah. Just because that's probably the number one question. I know that's the number one question I get asked about it, these it's days. It's a big these. fear, right? But no. Yeah. And but I, I will say this the the segment of the population that I think should be using creatine the most consistently, or maybe even should be marketed to the most towards are vegans. vegans. If you look at the I mean, I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with these studies on their cognitive function. It's a big boost. Now, it's not because uh, you know the creatine makes that big of a boost. You'll see a little bit in almost anybody, but it's because vegans don't eat a lot of creatine. They don't eat, and you get creatine from animal products. So they get it's like almost like they're deficient. And you see this, but, like, but, but they won't do it though because they're vegan, right? You can get creatine. Can you get creatine from from vegan sources? Uh, let's see. I, the last time I looked into it, I'm pretty uh, sure was, you could take. What it was it? a no, but. What are the two amino acids that make creatine? It's methionine and something else. Can't you just make it? 
or am I tripping? That's a good question. Ooh, That's something see. I'd have to. I actually. Um, let's see. I haven't. I, I did. I did. I did look into this. Look up vegan sometime. creating. Doug, I, thought, I thought you said you. Uh, we talked about that. A while yeah, ago. I think you can do vegan creating. I don't know. I, have, I haven't yeah, been wrong. I haven't been wrong in fifteen though, years. Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is never. <laughs> he's wrong right there. Yeah. Uh, oh, there. Look at there. Vegan friendly. The creatine in most supplements is synthesized from sarcosine and what and cyanamide and does not contain any animal byproducts. It is therefore vegan friendly. There you go. Okay, so those are <laughs> like chemical compounds. Where well, is that they, coming from? No, yeah. no, no, they're just it's making... It's still coming from an animal yeah, product, though. No, it's from amino acids. Yeah, it's I mean, it's friendly, but yeah, uh, <laughs> just because they like rebranded it. Uh, yeah, so yeah. It's it not... Still comes from it's, well, they, they might have gotten those from plants and then... Yes. You know, yeah, it, it, it's very, it's very quote-unquote, unnatural. Not that that makes it bad, but, you know, it's, 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 it's probably taking stuff from plants. And I, I know that... I know that the... Creatine in my product is not that it's it comes from animal sources and because because vegans have, have asked yours me. comes from um uh, from baby seals right uh, from <laughs> <laughs> from from yes from from their uh, genitalia yeah. <laughs> that's the best from, the best from, from creatine cells and oh, it's, wow. from infant and, and they, they also they need they need to it's die so a, a, an excruciating death you know how it's kind of like <laughs> adre <laughs> a, adrenochrome it's similar it's similar in seals you should it's you should you should clip this as an ad for, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure it's from black black we'll do well on facebook <laughs> yeah, some, some people, tiger, some tiger people tiger will tooth, you know. oh god yeah, yeah. Some yeah people will. okay we, no he's joking yeah, we're all joking from, from 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 dodo bird beat that i, <laughs> that I, <laughs> I, I no, buy on the black market i yeah. want to i want to ask you so okay when we were at the very beginning of this conversation we were talking about uh the business and uh you're sharing financials with us so when you talk about the financials and the 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 profit margins and things with the business you do not include the book so how are you how do you have your business say and does that include your coaching or do you have like tell me how you have the llc set up what are they how are they structured yeah yeah so i have s corps okay. and um so, so I have a publishing company and that handles all of the books. Okay, and then and then I have Legion that handles all the supplements and the coaching because we we are obviously a, a, a sports nutrition company. We focus our our primary source of revenue and really the brand is 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 uh, built around. If we're talking about products, just the products, it's the supplements. Uh, but the coaching does does quite well. It 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 still does um, seven figures in in revenue, but. It, it's something that we offer simply because a lot of people want it and we are able to do a good job with it, but it's not the the focus of the business. Yeah, and I so never I'm, I never see you market it really. I really don't ever see you. Which is a mistake. It. I mean the, so so yes and, yes and no. Well, well, I think there's some integrity to how you do it. So Yeah, I, I in you know, but I, I could I could market it could be marketed in a in an ethical way way sure. i mean I, the what the little marketing i do for it i would say is very ethical i don't overpromise i'm sharing real success stories these are real clients um yeah. and and i'm i'm also setting real expectations like you know this this person worked with us for 3 months and they here's what they here's what they accomplished and i'm not showing 12 months of results and saying it's 3 months and right. some people that you know it can be a big difference in 3 months or it can be a big visual difference or maybe a less big visual difference, even though they did quite well. Like if somebody starts very overweight three months, they could lose a lot of weight and you could see a difference, but it's not as striking necessarily as somebody who starts kind of overweight yeah. and then they, they get, then they have abs and you see that and, you know, right. Um, and, and so, so that's how I have, that's how I have them, them split out and, and just, just to run with that for a second with the marketing, as far as challenges, it's interesting. I'm now learning. So I, so I mentioned earlier this point of, timing and how important it is to do the right thing at the right time. That that explains a lot of my success as an author. Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, when I published it back in 2012, that was just the right book at the right time. Mm. I had no connections. Their Amazon advertising didn't even exist at the time. I just wrote the book. I was a dude. I had abs and muscles and I said I knew some things and and uh, you don't give end, yourself enough credit. You 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 put out good information, Mike. Let's be honest. 
I mean, I appreciate that. And I do try. I mean, that's yeah. what I've always done from the beginning is, is I, I, I really do try to make things clear and I try to make things practical. And I do try to, with that book, I, I was writing the book I wished that somebody would have just given me when I was 17 right. or 18 and said, hey, don't bother with all the stuff you're about to do. Just do this and you'll get a lot further. Um, um, but But still, if you look at the market, that was the right time for that book. Something like that did not exist, right? And so, so now, if I look at where Legion's at, and just just businesses, um, the biggest bottleneck is is execution. Is it's more on the team, and that's not to put down anybody I'm working with. It's more that we just there's only like fifty or fifty five of us. Well, that, this across. is my this is my point. What I meant by integrity, not by the integrity of you being able to market it in an ethical oh, way, but it. that yeah, yeah. as you scale a business, it's the reason why I've stayed away from this. The, it's very it, it, real quickly. It gets out of control. All of a sudden, your your fifty guys are now servicing a thousand people. And let's be honest, like how how well can they stay on top? Of, especially talking about nutrition and exercise, coach some you know a thousand people. Like I know as a coach for so many years that once I start getting beyond about twenty or thirty people, you know my my coaching dramatically drops the value of you yeah. because I'm not able to 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 reach you to touch you to be able to pay attention to what you're doing. So that's what I meant by your integrity is I know the the challenges of scaling that and you know you could throttle it down and make more money and you could advertise in an ethical way, but you probably your service would probably diminish is my guess. Great point. Yep. And and so that that is coming back to this point of you can only find and recruit great people so quickly. Yeah. Even even uh, you know, people I know with much bigger businesses than than I have who have several people in HR that that's all they do is read resumes all day and set up interviews all day and try to screen all day. And even those companies, I've heard from from owners of companies that uh, I mean in one case the market cap that recently went public. It's, it's a multi-billion dollar company. And uh, he, the the founder CEO, was telling me the same thing that that in marketing in particular, he's just frustrated that he's still too involved in the marketing. And now that 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 was probably about a year ago. Maybe that's not the case anymore. But um and and so to your point, yeah, that if you're gonna run a coaching service and you're gonna really provide a good service, then you're going to have to accept probably slower growth than you would like if you are an ambitious person, I guess, or if you're a greedy person, because there's there's finding good people and then there's onboarding them into your system and making sure that your quality control totally. is in. And and so I'm I'm much more interested, especially with the coaching is we just, we provide really good service. We provide, we get really good results. Um, our money back guarantee applies just like with our products where it's very simple. If you buy anything of ours and you don't like it, just let us know. We'll give you your money back. Or if you want something else, we'll give you something else, whatever you want. You don't have to fill out forms. You don't have to pay restocking fees. You don't have to return the product by carrier, by carrier pigeon to the <laughs> PO box in the Gobi <laughs> desert. Like you just tell us you didn't like it. And Fax if, it over. if, if we can't make it right for you, we'll just give you your money back. Similarly on coaching, if at any point somebody's not happy, if they're like, this did not work for me, we just give them all of their money back. And we rarely ever have to do that because it also, I like that from a from an organizational perspective because it 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 puts it puts a, a certain standard internally. It makes it clear that in coaching or anything else. We need to meet these expectations right. that we are promising. And if we don't, then we're going to know because we're going to have people who are, are taking us up on this money back guarantee. And so I like it. I like it from a, obviously from a marketing perspective and it gives people peace of mind. They understand that it's basically a no risk transaction at this point, yeah. but then internally it puts the pressure on my people to make sure that the quality is always there. Now, when you when you talk about the the ten to twelve percent uh, profit margins and and the coaching is in, 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 in within Legion, are you separating that out? That's the coaching is more profitable than that, or are you including the coaching in that in that number? Yeah, so so coaching is more profitable than oh, that, okay. but it's a small. It's it's not in the in the scheme of. Things that right, revenue. right. When we're talking about twenty, thirty million dollars, we're not talking about a, a bulk of that is coming from the coaching. But exactly. here's the thing, though: it's brilliant because 
if you're servicing those people, even if the, the margins were terrible, but you were somewhat profitable, you, I guarantee every one of your clients that are coaching are probably on every damn supplement you, you guys use. Yeah, so right. if you go above and beyond at taking care of them on the nutrition and exercise coaching, they probably end up being lifelong consumers of Legion. Yeah, we, so we learned that in the gym industry, with, right? Uh, with personal training. That's right. Mike, speaking of books, um, I know you're you're coming out with a new book. It's actually one of the reasons why we have you on this podcast right now. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, get to that. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that for a second. So, what is this new book? Who's it for? And what it's what's it about? Yeah, so so it's uh, it's actually already out. It's been out for about a month or so, and it's called Muscle for Life, and it is. Um, so uh, over the years, so I started with this Bigger, Leaner, Stronger book, right? And and then I had a lot of women reading it. And and then they were reaching out to me saying, hey, uh, a lot of this makes sense, but I don't want to be bigger per se. Um, should I be doing this? And, and so then I decided to take that book and rewrite it for women and change the workout programming and just make it as applicable to women as I possibly can. And, and, and I wrote other books and did other things. And Something though that I've I've always heard from the beginning is somebody who's I've heard from the forty year old, the fifty year old, the sixty year old, often not in good shape, very new to all of this, or maybe they were once in shape and now they're not, so they're they're getting back into it, and they would read bigger, leaner, stronger, or my thinner, leaner, stronger, which is for women. I actually liked the the title fitter leaner, stronger, better than thinner, but yeah. in surveying it with a bunch of women who were a good cross section of my target market, thinner, leaner, stronger, won by a huge margin. Sure. So I was like, oh, okay, wow. all right, the market has spoken. Um, <laughs> but regardless, so I, I would I would hear from these people and and they would read one of those books and they would like it and they would learn a lot, but they weren't sure if the program made sense for them, like you know, I'm asking you to squat, deadlift, bench press. Now we're going to do it appropriately. And you're going to, you're going to start with low weights and you're going to learn proper form. But still, if, you know, you guys know this, having coached so many people, if you have somebody who's 55 years old and has a lot of weight to lose, let's say more than 20 or 25% of their body weight, and they've never touched a weight before, you're not going to take them into your garage and load up the squat rack and, right. and tell them to, to, go have at it, right? You, you might start with like going for daily walks. Maybe we just start there. And, and on the diet side of things, you're not necessarily going to make them this all in, uh, you know, let's overhaul your entire diet. Let's get you the measuring cups. Let's get you the scale and, and let's do this. You might ask them to, you might ask them to write down what they tend to eat and maybe you're going to pick one thing like, okay, um, instead of the fried chicken multiple times or every day or whatever, can we, can we do some air fried chicken or instead of the thousand calorie frappuccino, can we scale that down to like a, a latte or even a cappuccino? Maybe can we get that down to like a hundred, 150 calories? And, and so, um, I kept on hearing from these people. And, and of course, they're, that that is the biggest addressable market really for, for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Is 40 plus out of shape wanting to get into shape. And those are the people who need the most help, actually. I mean, it's it's nice to help a guy go from jacked to a little bit more jacked. <laughs> and we all know that's cool. And it's like fun personally. Um, but there's, there's more maybe satisfaction in helping somebody lose a hundred pounds and come off all of their medications and completely change their everything really at that mm -hmm. point. Right. And, and so I, I, I had for a long time, kind of a standard canned response that explained to people basically like, here's how to modify this for you. Mm -hmm. Here's uh, the, the, all the principles that you learned, they apply to you. Of course, you have the same fundamental physiology, like the machinery is still the same, but we're going to work it differently. Maybe we will get to doing what's literally in the book, but, but we're not going to start there. And so that's why I, I wrote this book, Muscle for Life. It is for those people. It is for, also for people, if we take age out of the equation, take anybody who just has to lose a lot of weight. Like let's say again, tw more than 20 or 25% body weight that that is a a different uh very very different set of circumstances than somebody who just has maybe 20 pounds to lose and 
they already do a little bit of fitness, maybe even a little bit of resistance training. Maybe it's just like yoga here and there or whatever. Like that person, you, you can't just throw them into the gym actually and get them going and they'll do quite well. And so that, that's, that's why I wrote the book. And um, it also made sense for me to do this book. So this is the first traditionally published book. All of my books previously have been self-published. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that is, is for distribution because um, a lot of a lot of 40 plus people, they, I mean, if, if you've been to a bookstore recently, like look around. It's yeah. a lot of 40 plus people. Yeah. They a lot of a lot of them still buy books in physical locations. Whereas a lot of younger people, they'll buy the ebook on the, you know, a 25-year-old guy is probably going to buy the Kindle ebook and read it. So um, it's very hard to get uh, offline distribution to any degree even if you're a relatively successful self-published author. So that's, that's the gist of the book. And, yeah. and well, you're, you're actually, get what you're doing with this book is you're, sounds like you're targeting the, the, the bulk of the obesity chronic health epidemic. Cause you, what you that's really what you're dealing with. I mean, although we see childhood epi- uh, you know, obesity and health issues in people in their twenties and thirties, it's the, it's once you get over 40, where you really start to see yeah, for the counts. most part, Really bad. Uh, yep. uh, health that's when you can reach terminal velocity. I mean, that's like it's, Ab- absolutely. It's always so impressive to me talking to you that you understand this with as minimal coaching experience. Oh, what a as good you point. Yep. I, I, I find, you, you talk like someone who trains, yeah, who's I, trained people for. A I long mean, time. what you're literally saying right now is how we knew uh, Mind Pump was going to do as well as it did because when we looked at the landscape. There was so many fitness professionals that were literally speaking to other fitness professionals or the teenage boy who wants to get jacked. Like it literally all the marketing, all the books, all the programs online, like that and it, and there's such a small percentage. And we would all talk before Mind Pump existed, we would all talk off air and go, Man, when I when I look at the 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 hundreds and collectively thousands of people that we have trained. None of them look like that avatar. In fact, they look like who you're who you're talking about right now. And what I'm so impressed is that even the people that do get that there's a big market there, they still go about the advice wrong. And the advice you just gave is absolutely spot on and, and brilliant. And I think where so many yeah. people miss the mark on the is that they just think that like, well, this works for this group of people, so it should work for everybody else. And the reality is as a, a good coach knows how to meet somebody where they're at, and somebody who's extremely deconditioned, who has terrible eating habits, thinking that getting them to, you know, log into their fit scale and get their way out everything and hit deads and squats, you know, three to five times. I mean, it's just it ain't happening. And yeah. if you really want them to see lifelong results, you've got to find things that they can slowly start to build as far as good habits in their lifestyle, and then you build upon it. And I just, it always impresses me when I talk to you and you, you get that. Yeah, actually, I have a, I have a question along those lines, Mike. Um, you do a very good job of, of looking at and analyzing data, but there's a lot of people that do that pretty well. But here's the difference. You have the ability to take data, because here's where I see a lot of people get trapped. And this is our we have a uh, this is a bit of a pet peeve that we have because we look at data, we break it down also, but our experience is working with people. So we communicate it very differently. We know what to communicate, what not to communicate, and we also know, okay, well, real life, how does it apply? People who look at data tend to not consider that at all. So they just tell you the science, but they don't consider behaviors. They don't consider real life or whatever. You do a very good job of both. And you don't have a ton of experience training people. Where, where does that come from? Do you just listen to every Mind Pump episode? Like, where do you? How do you know how to communicate That's this the kind real, of stuff? I mean, all right, you got me. That's you just want to admit it, dude. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just good at stealing stuff from smart people. <laughs> That's it. No, That's it. All, but but all hey, it's aside. marketing. That's yeah. all marketing is. Yeah. Hey, no, all, That's all, a skill in itself. No, all joking it's aside. True, like all joking aside. Uh, I, how do you do that? Because data is important. But how it applies to people and considering behaviors, that's when it gets really effective. Like, what, What's your process like when you look at studies and you're saying, okay, should I communicate this or should I not? Or should I communicate it in this way? What's your process? That, that's, a, that's a good question. And I suppose that that's something that maybe is... Um, it's just it's just a personal preference. Like I'm a, I'm just generally a pragmatic person. I'm I'm interested in what works in in any field really. And in some ways, I mean, this is 
not to go off on like a, a metaphysical or epistemological tangent, but in some ways I would say to me, what's true ultimately is what works, uh, or at least that's enough. That's enough for me. Mm. Um, and, and so, so I've always kind of had that bent as an individual when I'm learning things, for example, I have always tended to like to learn things that I, I'm going to do something with. Just collecting random facts is, it, it can be gratifying, um, but in, in a sense, it's almost like intellectual junk food. It, it's it's better than, than watching Netflix, um, but, but I would much rather learn something that I can do something with. And that's, that's definitely true in the case of fitness and, and any other a uh, hobby that I've gotten into that I've that I've studied. I would say there are some topics that I've always just been interested in and I don't have any use for the information. I just like learning about it uh, for whatever reason. Like like ancient history, I've always just liked. I don't know why. I, I can just read that stuff and I have no no use for it. And I I I don't also maybe when I was younger I had the idea of well, if I knew a bunch of things, I could make people, I could impress people, or I could sound smart. Um, I, I could make for interesting, I could stand out in a, in a crowd or stand out at a party or something like that. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've moved away from that consciously because I, I actually just don't, I don't want to be like that. And, and so with, with fitness, I, myself, it also helped probably similarly to you guys is it started with me scratching my own itch, right? I was already doing this stuff and I wasn't getting great results from it. And I wanted to know how to get better results first and foremost. And I wanted to, to know the theory and the, the techniques that were going to get me better results. And I didn't really want to know all of the things that were not going to get me better results. And, and so that's how I approached Bigger, Leaner, Stronger in the beginning was very much like it was a, a minimum viable product kind of, kind of deal. It was maybe 50,000 words, that manuscript. Whereas uh, fast forward to today, I'm, I'm actually getting ready to release a new fourth edition. I've, I've rewritten it from scratch again. Wow. It's, uh, it's, it's a little bit autistic, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll say that, <laughs> but, but, but uh, I, I still stand by it. I think it's, it's, it, it's going to be bigger and, and even better. Uh, but regardless, I mean, now it's probably 130,000 words. So initially, it really was like, all right, um, I don't know everything but I've parsed through a lot of stuff and I can tell you that here are the most important things. If your goal, bigger than you're stronger, if you're a guy and you have yet to gain your first 25 to 30, maybe, maybe 35, but let's just say 25 to 30 or sorry, 20 to 25 pounds of muscle. This is it. This will do it for you. Now, if you are trying to, to gain every last ounce of muscle and strength available to you genetically, for most guys, that's probably 35 or 40, maybe a little bit more than that pounds, then you're probably going to have to know some other things and, and do some other things, but that's not most people. So, um, you know, I've always just come at this, this topic and, 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 and my work with that, uh, I've always kind of looked through that lens of what can I do with this? And, and some people they're not in, they just don't really think like that. Like they just, they are more interested in, for example, nerding out on the details and speaking to their peers, yes. other nerds. And, 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 the, and also there does seem to be a lot of, um, I don't know, showman uh, one upmanship and, and wanting to appear, uh, educated and wanting to, to try to impress peers, like not just communicate with them, but, but totally. show how maybe you even know more than they do or, or be accepted by people who have a bunch of acronyms after their names. And, and that's fine. If uh, that just has never been interesting to me. So, you know, if I, if I, if I liken it to, um, to maybe something, something relevant, like, like, like the American revolution, right. You had Thomas, Pain. His approach was communicate to the people in in words they can understand and in ways they can understand. Whereas the founding fathers actually were were intellectuals and they were communicating to their their peers. and And I would say if you look at all of the obscure references and the the complicated structures of 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 their of their writing, um, 
that they were probably not very interested in even trying to communicate to the average person. Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, you know, different thing, but without Thomas Paine, there might never have been the revolution because the average person wouldn't have known what the hell Jefferson and his friends were even talking about. They couldn't, (laughs) they couldn't understand it. I mean, people just weren't literate enough. You know, it's, it was a different time. No, I, I tell you, uh, we always say this on the show. Um, you've got good stuff. You know what you're talking about. You're one of the few people in the space that, um, we tell people you can trust, you can trust his advice, a lot of integrity. And then you have the unique ability of communicating science the way an experienced trainer would. And you, and you, and you're not, but you do. And it's very rare. In fact, I think you're the only person I know who can communicate like an experienced trainer and you've never really trained lots of people for long periods of time. So uh, it's a it's a compliment. So you, we, yeah, you seem to re- remain skeptical. That's what I think. Is I think that even you you have the ability, like not very many do, to be able to to read a study and and actually unpack it and be like, what does this mean? And then even when it points in a direction that may be favorable to something you're selling or you're doing, you still remain skeptical until you see the proof or feel the proof. I'm not going to double and triple down on it, which is not. Like most people, yeah. most people, if something confirms their bias, even in the slightest way, they are quick to market as fast as they can. So and prove it, or quick to their friends, so they can sound smart. Yeah. And I just think you remain skeptical and yeah. ignore, ignore, just just hunker down. If <laughs> yeah. there's ever even a, a peep of criticism or a shred of evidence that maybe something is otherwise, yeah. yeah, and and I get that we all have that 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 tendency and i think though that's that we monkey have brain. To try to, yeah for yeah sure. i mean we have to try to consciously work against it i i think if and and try not to get too emotionally invested i mean we see this in science a lot not not just sports science or nutrition science just just science in general you have a lot of researchers i mean you can we could understand where imagine the amount of time that somebody spends to get their phd in something and then the amount of time they spend in creating a model of some kind. I mean, you're looking at thousands of hours of work, right? And and they've built their own personal brand in their own circles. And uh, it, it credentialism seems to be particularly strong in those crowds mm-hmm. where um, there's there seems to be a strong desire to be accepted, to be in the in group, right? And and some of that is is financially driven. Um, and but regardless, so you have somebody who's invested a huge amount of their time and their energy and their emotions into something, and it it would be pretty jarring to come to a point where you just realize that you were wrong. That's yeah. it. it. All all of that was for nothing, uh, and at least that's how it feels, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's, it would be hard to go all jocko and be like, good. I just wasted uh, <laughs> six thousand hours. <laughs> now, now I can learn uh, new things. Yeah, you know, no, I I would say that one of the, a very important skill, um, especially today, is to learn how to read and understand studies, and also look at the studies and say, how does this actual does this actually mean anything, and can I replicate or duplicate it? I mean, I, I remember reading a statistic, especially in the in the mental sciences that the like something like a majority the vast majority of studies that show an effect cannot are, have never been uh, oh yeah duplicated. That the, re- the anybody listening look up the replication crisis it's awful it's, yeah. a, it's it's a it's a real yeah. thing in other and words like it, it, in other words zero it didn't mean anything because you can't duplicate yes. it so and and that's very very it's a big number especially in the psychology and in, in in mental sciences but it's still a big number even in the physiological sciences so it's a it's that skill is very important to have because we're in an age now where a study makes a headline and that headline means science is almost weaponized at this point totally i was just gonna say that because (laughs) yeah let's not go down that route no 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 no, but (laughs) don't anger the lizard people mike hey they already kicked they already kicked me off instagram i don't want the lizard people (laughs) kicking me off everything else too so all right brother we'll let you go man Thank you, guys. Always good good talking to you, Mike. Good seeing you again, brother. See you, man. Yep. You too.